And let me once again welcome everybody officially to today's event, Choosing Success, the Lessons of East and Southeast Asia and Vietnam's Future. This event is sponsored by the Harvard Kennedy School's Asia Programs and the Government Innovators Network. And I'd like to uh, pass control over to today's moderator, Dwight Perkins, who is the Harold Hitchens Burbank Professor of Political Economy at Harvard University. Mr. Perkins. Uh, thank you, Jim. Uh, this is Perkins. Uh, as, as Jim said, the uh, professor of economics in, at Harvard. And I'm moderating uh, today. Uh, good evening to those of you in Vietnam. Good morning to those of you uh, here uh, on the east coast of the U.S. The discussion today is based on a paper that a, a number of us did uh, called Choosing Success, the Lessons of East and Southeast Asia and Vietnam's uh, Future. The paper was done for the government of Vietnam, specifically for the Office of the Government and for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And we have, an, in addition to the paper that is available to you on the, uh, on the website uh, of the uh, uh, on the, of the Ash Institute website, and it's also available on the UNDP website in Vietnamese. Uh, the, uh, the paper, I re should remind those of you who are, are not familiar with it, is that it was written, of course, a year ago. So if you're looking for an answer to why the uh, financial markets of the world have been crashing for the last uh, few, few days or few weeks, uh, the, this paper does not give you an answer. However, it does point to some of the macro problems that have, in fact, uh, led to uh, some of the problems we see around the world today. But the focus today is on the, uh, is of course, on the Vietnamese economy. The there were a number of co-authors of of the, of the paper that we will be discussing. Uh, some of them will be speaking today, some not. So I'll just read off all of the. Uh, all the co-authors, uh, Vu Tang Tuang uh, and Nguyen Xuan Tang, Nguyen Tae Zhu, and Jonathan Pincus, uh, who are all at the Fulbright Economic Teaching Program in uh, Ho Chi Minh City in Vietnam. And they are actually there now. Uh, ben Wilkinson, who is also normally there, these was, will, is here in Cambridge at the moment and will be one of the speakers. The other co-authors, uh, David Dappas, uh, myself, and, and Tony Sage of, of the Kennedy School uh, are based here in, in Cambridge, but have had uh, extensive involvement with Vietnam over the past uh, 20 years. Speaking this, uh, the, uh, the funding for this whole effort uh, was provided by the U United Nations Development Program Office in Hanoi, uh, and they have also provided the funding for the three follow-up follow -up papers. Uh, the people who will be speaking today are a subgroup uh, of that, uh, of the co-authors, plus uh, an addition with an outside perspective. The speakers, in, in the order in which they'll be speaking, are David Daffis, who is a senior economist of the Harvard Kennedy School of Vietnam program, as well as a professor of economics at Tufts University. Vu Tang Tuang, who is director of research for the Fulbright Economic Teaching Program in Ho Chi Minh City, and a teacher and researcher, of course, in the program more broadly. Followed by Ben Wilkinson, who is the associate director of the Harvard Kennedy School of Vietnam program, and he is based in Ho Chi Minh City normally, but is here in Cambridge today. And then finally, uh, well, in addition, we will have Jonathan Pincus from the Fulbright Economic Teaching Program. Uh, he will not be speaking in a formal presentation at the beginning, uh, but he will be answering uh, questions as we go along. And then finally, giving an overview uh, from a broad background in development, including uh, rep being representative of the UNDP in Cambodia, the Ukraine, and Mongolia. We have Douglas Gardner, who is the Deputy Assistant Administrator and Deputy Director 
for the Bureau for Development Policy of the United Nations Development Program. So we're delighted you're all with us this morning, and I'm going to turn over immediately to David Dampas to start off on macro issues, and he will take about five minutes, and then we'll go five minutes and half after everybody has done their presentation, then we open it up to the most important part of this, uh, to this online event or seminar, and that is, of course, your questions and our attempt to answer them. So, Professor Daphos. Thank you, Dwight, and thank you, uh, everyone who is listening in, especially in Vietnam. I appreciate your staying up almost as late as you do for the World Cup matches, and that's a sacrifice indeed. Um, the um, way I want to approach this is, uh, to explain why we wrote this paper. Uh, we were asked to start thinking about growth strategy in Vietnam, and we thought the best way to answer that was to compare Southeast Asia and East Asia. If we could have slide. Uh, we have a graph which will come up shortly, which shows the growth of per capita or the level of per capita income in a number of countries. And uh, as you can see, uh, even setting the uh, city states aside, Taiwan and Korea in particular uh, started growing early and kept going to quite high levels, whereas most of Southeast Asia has stayed at relatively low levels. Uh, obviously, the Asian crisis of 1997 had something to do with that. Even Malaysia, which is one of the better uh, Southeast Asian countries, is really, by 2004, only about back where it was in uh, 1996. But in general, there seems to be a problem with Southeast Asian countries. They are able to grow uh, pretty fast for long periods, even decades, and then well before they're rich, they slow down. And the question is, why do they slow down? And the answer we come up with is that Southeast Asia mixes politics and economics in unproductive ways. Uh, in Philippines, Indonesia, Thailand, you had crony capitalism, uh, the rise of firms that were well uh, funded but not terribly efficient, poorly done urbanization, often associated with political instability, and as a result, an inability to uh, make the reform decisions needed to keep growth going. Vested interests basically started uh, getting more and more resources, and um, they were not uh, very efficient for growth. They were you know, good for dividing up the spoils, but not uh, for uh, creating long-term growth opportunities. Um, Vietnam, uh, our analysis is there is still a choice between being more like East Asia and more like Southeast Asia. Uh, and you know, indeed, the macro record in Vietnam has been very good since the early 1990s, high GDP growth, high export growth, uh, growing levels, especially lately, of uh, foreign uh, direct investment. Uh, until recently, low inflation and government deficits, that's changed. Um, and what I'm going to do now in a minute or two is just go a little bit beyond the paper and talk about, uh, you know, what, what happened in the last few years uh, and compress it, um, perhaps too much so. Uh, as Vietnam signed the bilateral trade agreement in the w, uh, tra World Trade Organization, um, this led to large capital inflows. Uh, some of them were called remittances, but we think they were really in large part capital. Others were short-term capital flows, uh, you know, uh, hedge funds or banks buying government debt. Others were foreign direct investment in property uh, as you began to get a property bubble. Uh, all of these uh, inflows created a problem for the central bank. Uh, they wanted to keep uh, exports uh, competitive, so they chose to keep the exchange rate stable. But that meant that they pumped lots of uh, dom, lots of money, Vietnamese money, uh, into uh, the economy as they bought up the dollars. And uh, as a result, credit doubled from June 06 to, Ju uh, to uh, June 08. Uh, and you know, when, you credit, when you double credit and you can only grow at you know, 6 or 8% a year, obviously things are going to happen. Now, what happened in Vietnam? Well, one is that inflation rose. Inflation is in the 30% range, at least measured. It might be higher. Uh, imports jumped to very, very high levels, uh, 20 or 25% of GDP this year. And uh, you started to get a bubble in stocks and real estate. Um, and you know, this has led to all sorts of problems. The uh, immediate response 
has been uh, perhaps a bit belated but good. Uh, credit growth has been reduced almost to zero, although a lot of this has been done by squeezing the private sector that provides most of the jobs. Um, the, um, there's been some pushback, I think, uh, from the large state firms that uh, really think they need uh, continued credit growth in order to continue their investment programs. And it, it seems likely that credit growth will resume uh, later this year. Uh, fiscal deficits are hard to measure, but they are large, uh, probably around uh, 7 to 10 percent of GDP, depending on how you measure some uh, types of spending. Uh, banks are, um, many of them very weak. The joint stock banks have greatly increased lending in the past uh, few uh, years, uh, especially for stocks and real estate whose prices have crashed, as we all know, and not just because of the last two weeks. And um, many of these banks have uh, large loan losses that are not realistically reported. Uh, but you know, all of this is sort of short term in a sense. What's the long term issue? The long term issue is that uh, the um, enterprise survey in 2007 found nearly half of the capital going to state enterprises, 46% uh, I think it was, who account for about one-tenth of the output growth in, an, in industry and almost no employment growth. So you've got huge chunks of capital being put into firms that are not contributing very much. Uh, and uh, when you have capital going to low productivity uses and spending a lot larger than output, you leave yourself very vulnerable uh, to macroeconomic shocks such as those we are now observing. Um, even FDI, which is viewed as one of the great successes, and properly so, is tilting away from export manufacturing growth and towards property and real estate. And uh, I think a lot of that uh, is responding to the bubble uh, in real estate prices that you had. So uh, that could quickly reverse itself, even remittances. So uh, bottom line, to sum up quickly, Inflows, uh, in part because of this world crisis, uh, could slow down or even reverse um, as conversion rises. Uh, I think that uh, many of the government projects are of low productivity and probably will be pressed, even though that will put pressure on, um, uh, on, on credit growth and take away from the private sector. And uh, there's a real short-term danger that sharply lower inflows uh, will match with this long-term misallocation and create a slowdown for the Vietnamese economy. That's what we're afraid of. Uh, thank you, Professor Dapas. Uh, the next speaker. speaker is Butang Tuang uh, from Ho Chi Minh City. Tuang? Yes. Uh, good morning. Uh, uh, my presentation is based on a co-author work with Dwight Perkins on industrial policy in Vietnam, uh, sponsored by UNDP in Vietnam. And uh, let's let me let me briefly uh, talk about the major issues in industrial policy in Vietnam, and then go quickly into the implications of those policies. So Vietnam industrial sector has gone through a remarkable transition since 1989 from a centrally planned system to a new system in which the location of input and output is determined largely by the market forces. And if we look into this slide, uh, you can see that industrial production of the state sector today accounts for only about 30% of the total and down from 50% just 10 years ago. And it's also remarkable that Vietnam accomplished this transition while avoiding the sharp fall in GDP and industrial output that occur in many other centrally planned economies. And another remarkable thing about Vietnam's industrial uh, industries is in the 80s, virtually no Vietnamese industries were capable of selling their products in the demanding market like you know, Europe or North America. But nowadays, for example, in 2007, Vietnamese export was nearly 50 billion, in which industrial products are largely, you know, are largely contributor to this uh, export sale. So the question is, what are the key to this success? Uh, in our opinion, much of the success in industrial development so far has been the result of government decision to remove barriers to 
you know, to entrepreneur a fraud for both foreign direct investor and, you know, more recently for domestic private investor. So basically, the government decided to step back, you know, instead of intervening uh, heavily into the economy. So the first step is to remove the restriction on imports and access to foreign exchange. The second step is to, you know, to create a favorable environment for FDI, starting with the implementation of the law on foreign investment into in uh, 1987. And more recently, the most important step is to pass the two enterprise law, the, the 1990 enterprise law and 2000 enterprise law, that effectively made the establishment of domestic private firms easier. And this led to the boom in the uh, uh, establishment of the new firms. And if you can see in the, in the slide on the screen, the annual business registration went up sharply after 2000. And now the number of uh, private enterprises in Vietnam is about 350,000. And it is uh, estimated that the amount of capital invested by those private domestic firms is even more than the foreign direct investment in the last 20 years. And uh, in recent years, there have been several waves of equitization that you may, uh, if you, you may have heard about. And uh, in some cases, this equitization has led to the creation of corporations truly independent of state control. But in other cases, you know, for example, in the so-called strategic industries, the state has retained major uh, control over the firm. Now, looking forward to sustain rapid industrial growth, we involve continuing efforts to create favorable environment for firms, especially for domestic private firms, uh, by removing bar barriers, uh, you know, for example, either left over from the central planning or new regulatory barriers put up for one reason or another. Uh, in the recent World Bank Doing Business report, Vietnam doesn't score very high in terms of business environment. And let me show you the picture. Okay. Okay. It's not. Okay, here we go. And it, uh, as you can see, the uh, the rank of Vietnam is at the bottom half, and actually it's wasn't, in, you know, in compared to other countries in the region. So, you know, in addition to hampering investment, many of these regulatory barriers contribute to the level of corruption in Vietnam. And you know, when we talk about this environment, there is also a need to create a legal and regulatory system for resolving commercial disputes, which now you know, largely handled by discretionary authority of government officials in a quite non-transparent way. So the bottom line is, most of all, Vietnam must create a competitive environment for our own industries. You know, economists disagree on many things, but the one thing they agree on is that it is competition that drives industrial growth and rising industrial productivity. But our concern is the current Vietnamese industrial policy appear to be raising barriers to competition rather than establishing an environment that allows more competition. For example, recently the government has created state owned conglomerates mainly in heavy industries, you know, and the stated goal is to create large operations that can become internationally competitive, you know, like Sony or Samsung. But it is argued that Korea Bill is last conglomerate with substantial support from the government and Vietnam should and could try to do the same. But I would like to to know that there are two fundamental differences between Vietnam and Korea. The first difference is in Korea most of these firms were private while all the conglomerates in Vietnam are state owned with their board of directors and top management selected by the government. And the second key difference is in Korea in exchange for temporary government support, which lasts for a, a few years, one of these large chairbones were expected to become internationally compared to exporter. The situation is in Vietnam is quite different. Vietnam's Congress are still largely oriented toward import substitution and domestic monopoly.
And another thing which is, I think, very important is it's important to remember that the international economic environment now is very different from that existed in the 60s to 70s when other East Asian uh, early developers prepare for their takeoff. For example, during that period, Taiwan and South Korea would use tariff quota, you know, subsidized credit and tax break and so on to promote particular industry. But these options are no longer available to Vietnam today. That means, you know, Vietnam needs to find a way to compete. But with the current industrial policy, I'm not sure if Vietnam can do that effectively. And the final point I would like to make in this opening comments is that as in many other countries, Vietnam policymakers often see industrial policy as only a part or sometimes even a small part of the range of policy and institutions that actually shape how industry develops. For Vietnam, for example, industrial policy is something that is done by the Ministry of Trade and Industry or the MPI. However, uh, you know, the Ministry of Trade and Industry in Vietnam is really mainly a ministry for state-owned industrial enterprises. But this sector today accounts for only a third of all Vietnamese industries. And in reality, industrial policy in Vietnam, you know, includes everything from macroeconomic policy to the creation of institutions in support of markets, such as law protecting property rights. And Vietnam can hardly achieve its ambitious goal of becoming an industrial countries if it is unable to effectively address the current macro instability, like what Professor David Dapis just uh, discussed, you know, deal with the bottlenecks of, uh, in infrastructure, especially in transportation and electricity. It can have, you know, uh, industrial uh, industrialization if uh, the line is shut down every, uh, you know, one or two, one or twice every week uh, or so. And you know, we need to, Vietnam need to restructure the financial sector so that capital is allocated to the firms that can use it most efficiently. And I'm sure that this topic will be taken up by, by, by uh, some of my colleagues, uh, so why don't I just stop here? And I'm looking forward to having further discussion with the audience. <coughs> thank you. Uh, thank you, Duang. Uh, before we go on to uh, Ben Wilkinson, I just want to remind the participants in the online seminar that uh, they can raise questions at any time. and. We will accumulate the questions and then uh, ask, answer, answer them uh, systematically one at a time after the, these opening remarks. If you can do it now, you don't have to wait until after the opening remarks are finished. Uh, the next speaker is uh, Ben Wilkinson. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dwight. Um, I will uh, briefly comment on uh, higher education in Vietnam. Um, when we, in, in, in writing Choosing Success, uh, um, those of you who have had a chance to read the paper know that we identified six, six uh, areas that we believe uh, determined to a fairly large extent why East Asia maintained, attained a high level of growth and retained a high level of growth for many decades and why Southeast Asia, although enjoyed certain periods of, of high growth, as, as uh, David Dappis mentioned earlier, was unable to retain that, that growth. And one of, the, one of the areas in which I think the, the contrast between, North, uh, between East Asia and Southeast Asia is most stark is in the area of higher education. Um, Southeast Asia basically lacks good universities. Um, now, there's no perfect metric for measuring higher education quality, but if you, for instance, look at any of the uh, internationally used uh, rankings of universities, I don't believe you'll find a single Southeast Asian university, again, outside Singapore on, on any of those lists. Uh, in contrast, in Korea, in Taiwan, and now in China, we're seeing the emergence of uh, institutions of higher learning, of universities and research institutes which are truly attaining uh, world-class levels of, of, of quality. Uh, now, Vietnam is, uh, is, is many, of our, many of our guests today are, from, are calling in from Vietnam and they well understand uh, just how serious the challenges Vietnam are, is confronting in higher education. Um, of course, we all know that Vietnam has in the past enjoyed uh, 
uh, a high, I think, a fair degree of success in universalizing primary education, and Vietnam has attained high levels of literacy. But um, just being able to to read and write in, at, a, at a basic level is clearly not enough uh, to develop a a modern uh, value-added economy. Uh, Vietnamese, Vietnamese universities uh, are deep troubled, and if you see on the slide here, uh, well, there are a number of factors behind behind why that explain why Vietnamese universities are simply not providing the economy and society with the human capital uh, they need. One is that Vietnamese universities have uh, expanded dramatically over the last uh, 15 years or so. Uh, you can see that university enrollments have shot up, um, but the number of teachers has, has, has barely increased. And so obviously the implication is that, is that uh, you have overcrowded classrooms and overworked uh, teachers. And I would add that even despite this dramatic increase, Vietnam still, as uh, in compared with other countries, in the region has a uh, has a low uh, low level of uh, tertiary enrollment, but we believe that perhaps the biggest factor behind the uh, the crisis that Vietnam is facing in higher education is in the area of governance. Um, when you look around the world, good universities, whether they're in Boston or in Beijing, share certain fundamental features in common that really uh, transcend the specific historical, political, and economic context in which they are located. Uh, good universities have autonomy. They have merit-based personnel systems. They uh, have meaningful linkages to industry as well as to global development in, uh, in, in science and knowledge creation. Um, and so there's really no unique way to build a good university. And uh, Vietnam simply doesn't have those, Vietnamese universities simply aren't operating according to those, those fundamental characteristics. Um, I would add that uh, we have written about issues of governance in Vietnamese higher education in other places. Um, and uh, so, so and, and some of that, is available, that analysis is, is available uh, online. So the, the result is that Vietnamese universities are not preparing, are not developing the human capital that Vietnam needs. And, and, uh, and uh, in my view, there's probably no better uh, indicator or symbol of that failure of higher education than the troubles that Intel has faced in trying to recruit the uh, engineers that it needs to staff its uh, $1 billion uh, uh, chip making and testing facility that it that it intends to build in Ho Chi Minh City. Um, the bottom, the, the, the in a nutshell, Intel has given uh, a series of basic assessment tests to uh, Vietnamese IT students and engineering students over the last two years. Um, approximately 2,000 students took their took the first exam in 2007, and uh, we're told that only two percent of students who took that test. Uh, passed, and of the, that small group who did pass, uh, 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 only, only a, a, a even smaller uh, cohort had the English level uh, that would enable them to actually, you know, for for Intel to to uh, to hire them, and uh, that is a fairly stark indicator, I think, of just how 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 broad the the disconnect is between what Vietnamese uh, students are learning in school. And what the market requires, and as we, as, as uh, one of the cornerstones of Vietnam's uh, development strategy is to move out of, sort of low value added manufacturing into into more advanced uh, knowledge based industries, and certainly that that goal will I, be uh, stillborn if uh, Vietnam cannot improve improve its institutions of of higher learning. Um, now, of course, uh, I would just like to wrap up by by, by just uh, sharing a few thoughts on 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 uh, what how Vietnam can respond to this reality. Um, one of the one of the challenges in higher education, of course, is that while some of the challenges that Vietnam faces uh, can be resolved to a degree just by making a a policy change at the at the stroke of a pen, if you will, uh, 
institutions of higher learning take decades, if not centuries, to develop. And so uh, every, every minute that, that Vietnamese universities uh, are not evolving, they, Vietnam is just following, falling further and further behind global trends in, in knowledge. So uh, dramatic and urgent action is clearly required. Um, and uh, while there are, uh, are, are an array of uh, steps that, that the government will need, to, will need to take, I would just return to the observation about governance and that there, there, there is really a fairly high degree of, of, of consensus about the, co about, about the building blocks of excellence in, in higher education. And uh, Vietnam will clearly need to, to move in that direction. Um, if it's going to to, redress, to address the, the really serious situation it's facing there. Um, I will uh, wrap up my comments here, uh, but I'm delighted in, uh, uh, to, to address higher education further in uh, any follow-up. Thank you. Well, we already have a follow-up question, which we'll get to in a moment. And again, I encourage people to record their questions uh, now. They don't have to wait to the end of the discussion. but. Our final speaker is, is Doug Garden, <coughs> who's an, uh, a perspective from outside of Vietnam, but with extensive experience in a range of developing countries, many with similar kinds of problems and issues that, that Vietnam faces. So I turn it over to Doug. Um, thank you very much, Dwight. Uh, good morning and good evening to everybody. Um, for our listeners in Vietnam, I think you've heard the excitement in people's voices this morning. I think it's for two reasons. One, we have an excellent report that we're drawing from. And two, um, the Boston baseball team, the Boston Red Sox, won a very important game last night. And everybody in Boston is excited about that. Um, but I, as Dwight said, I'm, I'm not an expert on Vietnam. Um, but I am among those who have greatly admired um, the remarkable accomplishments of Vietnam over the past several decades. And I've been able to observe this from neighboring countries, Cambodia and Myanmar, and also in Thailand um, when I was working at the Mekong Committee dealing with the Mekong River and the Mekong Delta. I've also had the chance to work with the colleagues around this table in the Asia program, and they've oftentimes spoken about Vietnam. I wanted to react to the report as an outsider, and I wanted to do that in three areas. I wanted to um, talk about the power of independent policy analysis. I wanted to secondly look at what is success um, that you're choosing. And thirdly, I have a couple of comments on the report. First of all, UNDP as an organization believes strongly in supporting national development with focused research. Reality can be very different depending on the person who's defining the reality and the organization that's defining the reality. Having a fix on what is really happening in people's lives and why is crucial for an effective state to be able to serve its people. UNDP has tried to do this in its human development reports around the globe. I was particularly pleased to read Choosing Success and to understand that this was a report that was sought by the Vietnamese government. Um, this to me is a very good sign that when there's a thirst for analysis, good things happen. There's a saying which we have in English which I think is relevant to this, which I wanted to share with you, which is, the best mirror is a good friend's eye. In other words, you turn to friends who you know and you trust because you value their, their judgment. And I think that's what we have in this report. Um, it's been sought by Vietnam. And um, I wanted to share a couple more comments on the report. First, the title. When you pick up the paper and you read Choosing Success, you scratch your head and you say, hmm, yeah, that's right. Success is not automatic. It is not something that happens at random. It is a very distinct choice. And as the report says, it's a number of different factors that you choose all happening at the same time. It's not willy-nilly. A nation state is endowed by some fixed factors. It's geography, it's natural resources. Those are the blessings that it has 
um, by the creator. But there are many other factors which are chosen factors, which are the ones that really are the ones that lead to the different um, charts we were looking at with regard to East Asia or those for countries that have not yet been as successful. Within that domain, um, we have in the UN system, and Vietnam is a very active member of that UN system, pulled together the Millennium Declaration that Vietnam was a signator to. In there, success is defined by progress on the eight Millennium Development Goals related to poverty, child mortality, maternal mortality, HIV, AIDS, environment, etc. I'm very happy that Vietnam has done so well so far on the Millennium Development Goals. However, um, we have a famous basketball player by the name of Michael Jordan who was always very successful. Success is not automatic. Michael Jordan could have an off night. Statistics could fall. And we've seen that in other countries. When they thought success was there on Millennium Development Goals, I look at countries in, in um, different parts of the globe who thought they had handled HIV AIDS, only to find slippage. So it's just a, you know, a congratulations to Vietnam on the success that you had so far on the MDGs, but there are ongoing issues of retaining that success, of looking at quality of life, particularly in urban areas, um, and I'll, I'll leave that MDG thought. A few thoughts on the report I wanted to raise. Um, in reading this, I was, you know, as a UNDP staff member, feeling very much at home. Why? Because it's a development report. It looks at development in its holistic nature. Development is not about any one individual sector. It's about the whole mix and how a country can try and get those right for the well-being of its people. I was also pleased that education was put up front. In every country that I've served, the number one issue with government has been getting their education system right. In Vietnam, you're fortunate that the focus is on higher education. Um, I was happy to also see that primary and secondary were raised there, but in other countries and neighboring countries to Vietnam, uh, primary education is the biggest issue. When I paid my farewell visit to the Prime Minister of Cambodia a year ago, I had the opportunity to talk about any topic under the sun, and the one topic I focused on is education. So my belief is no matter what the country, this is, this is the starting point. Equity, delighted to see that was in there. It's all about including the excluded whether that is the school system, the health system, the economic system, or the geographic issues which lead to people being remote, to ethnic minorities. Equity is key for the long-term success of all people in the nation. Um, I wanted to conclude with a um, you know, with that thought that this is a very special analysis, it's independent, and we hope that it will continue to support um, the decision makers in Vietnam. And I wanted to um, end with perhaps a request to the, um, to the experts on Vietnam, and not just um, comment on the report, but as was said earlier, the world has changed since this report has been written. Um, as the questions unfold, I would be very interested to hear from the experts their views on two specific things. One, how this financial crisis that is presently unfolding could potentially impact Vietnam and the mitigating measure, measures that it might take. And the same thing for the topic of climate change. Climate change is something that, that UNDP has focused on in our last human development report. It's something I know that Vietnam is very concerned about with the Mekong Delta area, but I'm just wondering if our experts on Vietnam might also share some thoughts on that topic and how Vietnam might mitigate the forthcoming um, issues that are surfacing with uh, climate change. Thank you, Floyd. Thank you, Doug. Uh, we will definitely get to those two questions, but uh, I think we should begin with some questions from the other participants here. We have three that are really uh, on the same basic topic. And the key this really is uh, directed to, to, to Ben, but also to others such as Jonathan, for example, may want to come in on this, which is the question of 
what is it one actually does uh, to imp improve the uh, education system? Uh, I think what they're looking for are specific suggestions uh, as to how the education system could be improved. And I know you gave a number of general things, but you might uh, then want to go a little bit further into some specifics. And if uh, Jonathan or Tuang, if you want to come in on this, uh, please feel free to do so. Uh, thank you, Dwight. First of all, let me ask, uh, Jonathan, are you there? Yeah, can you hear me? Uh, yeah, we hear you great. Uh, would you would you like to uh, uh, comment on on some specific actions that Vietnam can take uh, to improve higher education? <clears throat> well, I think you you said it quite well, which is that at, at the heart of the matter, um, it's a governance issue. It's a question of how university. Are you there? We're, we're losing you, Donna. Okay, it seems like we may have uh, we may have lost uh, Jonathan, but uh, let me just just um, in response to the participants' question, um, it it uh, as I said at the outset, we believe that the that the 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 key to improving outcomes in higher education will be governance. Um, within governance. Uh, there one particular uh, there there are sort of two interrelated um, issues that I think we could could sort of bear bear further comment. One is uh, the importance of of increased autonomy, um, especially for research oriented universities. Um, universities need to have the space to be able to innovate in terms of their curriculum and uh, the pri priori priorities in research and to be able to uh, make decisions critically regarding human capital. Who gets hired to be a teacher and, uh, and, and who, gets, who gets promoted. Um, but uh, an, an equally important and related factor is accountability. Um, and I mention that particularly because there's a lot of discussion in Vietnam now about um, accreditation. And uh, that, that accreditation, essentially, that universities ought to be judged according to how they how they perform in a in a against a set set of criteria. And my personal view is that the debate about accreditation is a little bit uh, of a red herring, because accreditation, uh, which does work in, in in many countries, including in the United States, uh, accreditation is predicated on the the uh, the assumption that there will be consequences for an institution if they fail to live up if they fail to score well according to a given set of criteria and uh, those those the the consequences might be a reduction in funding the consequences might be changes to the leadership of an institution and uh, a related point. Is that, is that accreditation and autonomy are, 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 are necessary to create an environment in which there is more competition. And in any effective uh, uh, higher education ecosystem, universities compete with each other. Um, I had the privilege of, of being able to visit several um, elite Chinese universities this spring. And one thing that struck me was listening to the president of one of the top universities in China, uh, very, very, uh, 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 was very proud to say that he had been luring leading faculty from other institutions, not only within China, but, but abroad from the United States to his university. And so universities, there, there is a competition for talent and for, and for, for students, and by extension for, uh, for financial and other, and other resources. And, and any effective uh, higher education system has competition, and there really just isn't enough yet in Vietnam. Uh, Ben, just one sort of follow-up question immediately on this. Uh, Asked about how about the curriculum and teachers' pay? 
Well, that that's um, you know that that person really sort of put the put the uh, you, you know hit the nail on the head, um, and I would say immediately that uh, I I am certainly not um, the the best person to comment on this on on this issue in Vietnam. It's fortunate to have a number of uh, wonderful analysts and commentators on the problems in higher education. I would direct anyone to the an essay by Professor Huang Tui. And Professor Huang Tui, for those of you who don't know, is a leading mathematician in Vietnam who was recently emerged as a, as a very important uh, critic of higher education. And Professor Huang Tui has written that at, at, at some length and in a very compelling manner about the importance of incentivizing uh, researchers and, and teachers and making sure that he, he, what he calls it the salary income paradox, essentially making sure that, that until, until university instructors can earn a, a living wage that enables them, that is also linked to, to their performance in the classroom and in the laboratory, it will be very difficult to have, uh, to, to, to have um, better, better outcomes. Um, I would say that, that uh, one further comment in, on, um, along these lines is that, as we all know, Vietnam is sending increasing numbers of uh, young people overseas to study, both at, both at high school, undergraduate, and graduate level. Uh, and these, these are uh, you know, very talented young people, and um, particularly those now studying at the graduate level represent, frankly, I, I represent the future of uh, Vietnamese higher education. And um, I have sort of, sort of conducted an, an, an informal and certainly unscientific poll of graduate students studying overseas, and these graduate students overseas, and and uh, when I ask them if they if they in, uh, would like to return to Vietnam, they um, um, a vast majority say yes, absolutely, I want to go back to Vietnam. But then if you ask the follow up question, well, would you like to go back to a Vietnamese university? They react with horror, and uh, it's easily understand. We we can all understand why. Uh, the simple reality is that teaching in a Vietnamese university is. Uh, it, the, the, the professional environment in a Vietnamese university bears no resemblance to the professional to the to the academic environment that these young scientists and scholars have been accustomed to in their studying, whether it's in the United States or in Europe or in Australia. And so, if Vietnam is unable to create the incentives to attract these young these these the, 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 these young scientists and scholars back to universities, I think there's 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 the, the, the prospects that Vietnam can can improve dramatically in higher education are fairly are fairly slim. Uh, thank you, Ben. Uh, before we go to some of the other participants' questions, uh, I think it would be useful to try to answer or at least give some insight into the question raised by Doug Gardner, which the whole question of what the current international financial crisis uh, is likely to how it's likely to impact Vietnam. I mean, I assume most Vietnamese banks have not been buying American subprime loans, uh, and I, uh, uh, AIG does operate in Vietnam, but probably Lehman Brothers is not a major player in Vietnam. So uh, the question is, uh, Vietnam is somewhat insulated, but uh, certainly not completely, and I wonder, uh, maybe David Davis, start off, and Tu Ang, if you want to come in on this. Uh, I, I think uh, Doug's questions uh, neatly frame both the short-term and the long-term problems that uh, Vietnam faces. In the short term, as we said, they have a growth strategy that relies on very high flows of uh, short-term, in many cases, capital uh, or voluntary capital, uh, like remittances, that can uh, reverse very quickly. Uh, and with a worldwide uh, tendency to avoid risk, uh, I think Vietnam, with 30% inflation and high deficits, is regarded as risky. And so I think it would be only prudent to expect uh, lower capital flows in the near future and uh, to adjust investment and uh, to strengthen banks uh, so that uh, they can overcome any challenges that might arise. Uh, in particular, weak banks are a very bad thing to have 
when you uh, are facing these kinds of problems because uh, there's a question of systemic risk where enough of them fail that all of the uh, you know lending relationships and so on a firm might have loans from more than one bank or do business with a company that does business with another bank and if if the joint stock banks go under, and many of them have made loans for both stock and real estate in fairly large amounts domestically, uh, and these uh, assets go down in price as they have dramatically, uh, then the assets to back uh, the loan are no longer there, and the banks may very well be insolvent. At that point, they should be merged or taken over rather than allowed to continue gambling with other people's money when they're broke, because they tend to make very uh, big bets and, and often not very good ones. Uh, this is why uh, some large U.S. institutions were taken over for exactly the same reason. Uh, so I think uh, the internal uh, real estate and stock bubbles in Vietnam uh, create the same dangerous conditions for banks that our real estate bubble did for our banks. And uh, I think the response has to be more aggressive than it has been. Uh, this is something that will work out over the next year or so, uh, and if uh, steps are not taken, I think they could be very disruptive if, if capital flows slow down. On the long-term uh, issue of the environment in particular, a World Bank study uh, recently found that Vietnam was the most vulnerable large country to rising sea levels. The Mekong Delta in particular uh, could be largely flooded uh, with a several meter rise in sea levels. Uh, no one's quite sure how many meters the sea is likely to rise over what time period, but well before that, an increasing number of storms, of salt water intrusion will play uh, hob, will, will cause great damage to rice and other crops that uh, cannot uh, you know, tolerate salt very well. Um, so I think you have, even over the next 10 to 20 years, a uh, prospect of real problems in what is the rice bowl after all of the country. And it's a significant uh, part of the world uh, rice export market. So uh, I think uh, definitely more attention has to be uh, play, put onto that, uh, probably in an adaptation sense of, you know, do you build dikes or do you choose other crops or do you breed salt tolerant crops or breed fish or whatever. Um, you know, uh, those, those questions I think need to be put on the front burner rather than the back burner. Thank you. Ryan, do you want to come in on this? Uh, sure. I, I would like to add a few points on the implication of uh, what happened recently in the international financial market to Vietnam. I think the Vietnamese uh, financial institutions are not so much integrated into the international financial system. And uh, I, I had opportunity to, to talk with some bankers in Vietnam, and most of them said that they are not worried, they were not worried about the situation so in, in the short term. So they don't see any short term problems because they are not integrated deeply into the financial, the international financial system and they are not so much exposed to the risk created by the financial crisis in the US. Uh, I would like to comment on another, you know, area which is the lessons that the Vietnamese, uh, you know, uh, Vietnamese policy makers can learn from what happened in the U.S. I think the first very important lesson is, you know, the, the regulation should go in hand with, you know, supervisory system. So basically what happened in both the U.S. and Vietnam is the system is deregulated very fast without putting into place a system, a appropriate system in supervision. For example, you know, in Vietnam, we allowed the rural banks to be upgraded into urban banks without much of, you know, the supervision. And another thing is we, Vietnam has allowed uh, many state conglomerates to open financial firms or stock firms and, you know, banks and so on. And that creates uh, many problems for the current situation in Vietnam. The second issues, the second lessons that Vietnam can learn from what's going on in, in the U.S. is accountability. So right now, the situation in Vietnam is if, you know, they say have the moral hazard problem. So banks, especially the private uh, 
find are uh, thinking that the government cannot let them fail, and that creates huge problem. And if you put this problem in the context of the uh, of the uh, you know current macroeconomic uh, instabilities, the assets bubble, for example, the the real estate and the stock market bubble, and then you can see that in the I think in the next several months there's going to be a you know some huge problem in the banking system. The reason is because the market, the asset market was bubble about a year ago, and now by the, the last quarter of this year or the first quarter of the next year, those loans will be due, and you know meaning that you know banks and financial institutions will incur more bad debt and non-performing loans, and that may trigger some you know collapse of banks and financial institutions in Vietnam. And you know, I think this problem needs to be taken care of immediately, especially, especially you know, when uh, in terms of uh, supervision. Yep. Thank you. I'd like to maybe just one way of summarizing what the previous two remarks have said is that uh, Vietnam has some very similar kinds of problems to what has happened in the U.S. and and it's happening in Europe as well. But it's largely a homegrown problem, not a uh, international uh, effect problem. Uh, the one area, though, where the international crisis will directly affect Vietnam, I think, needs to be added. It, if it leads to a substantial recession in the rest of the world, it's definitely going to affect Vietnam's ability to export uh, to uh, to the rest of the world, and that will obviously feed back into into the economy. Uh, we we have a a variety of, of additional questions uh, from the participants. Um, one of them is, I haven't read uh, Choosing Success, but I wonder if the report addresses, addresses the question of who it is that chooses success. Uh, now, uh, the report is obviously directed to the government, and that's one of the elements, but uh, who would like to come into the question of who actually chooses success in Vietnam? Um, I guess I'll start with that. Uh, the, you know, uh, the way Vietnam makes decisions is complicated, and it has to be understood that it is complicated. Um, in the old days, most investment was state investment, and if a province, you know, wanted a particular project, it would go to Hanoi and uh, take uh, some minister or somebody to lunch and uh, try to persuade them that uh, that was a really good idea to put some money into their province. It isn't quite like that now. It's uh, more complicated, but still, uh, a lot of investment uh, decisions are political decisions rather than economic decisions. And um, I think that is much less true in the private sector, but the private sector in any uh, credit squeeze is among the first to be squeezed. Uh, the uh, government and state enterprise investment tends to be the last to be affected unless there is a formal uh, decision. So I think you know the, the political system, which includes the government and provincial officials and party officials and so on, collectively uh, make a lot of economic decisions on a political basis. And um, you know, I'm not saying that economics never intrudes, but I think it's often an afterthought. And uh, if, um, if, if that mechanism is maintained, under a system of uh, a situation of great stress, I think there's a lot of dangers for the Vietnamese economy. Let me just mention that uh, Deutsche Bank recently came out with an analysis suggesting 4% growth next year, 4.1, I think. Um, and um, the uh, economist is suggesting about 5% growth for the next decade. So you have a, a number of outside observers, not simply us, that you know, see significant slowdowns in the economy, in part reflecting the risks we're discussing. I, I quite agree with uh, Professor Perkins that uh, we could well see more pressure on export growth over the next year or two as we get into a global slowdown or recession. And I think even though the banks uh, do not directly get credit 
uh, very much uh, from outside. The government does, and the government could end up paying very, very high rates of interest uh, for its own debt if it wants outside financing, which it will probably need if uh, inflows slow down. So I think even though the banks are not financially connected, as Tuang uh, correctly observed, uh, the economy is. And uh, I, I think you have to keep that in mind as you look forward. Let me just uh, add to what David just said. Um, over the last uh, nine months, we've frequently been asked um, for our assessment of uh, the short-term challenges as distinct from long-term challenges. And I think our response, and this is clearly the implication of choosing success, is that that's a unhelpful distinction uh, because the current, the macroeconomic instability that Vietnam has, has experienced over the last nine months, while international factors um, maybe had some impact, uh, it was by and large uh, a result of internal factors. And, and, and I think it's safe to say the macroeconomic instability Vietnam is experiencing today is the unavoidable consequence of a strategy uh, or of, of, of structural distortions in the Vietnamese economy that have been there for a long time. We often refer to it as dualism, and, and we touched on it at the outset of, the, uh, of, of our discussion this morning. Basically, Vietnam gives uh, a lion's share of investment and credit in the economy to a sector, the state sector, that doesn't produce jobs, doesn't produce value added, doesn't produce exports, and that that over the long term is simply not a strategy to be successful. So to return to the question of decisions that need to be taken, uh, fundamentally Vietnam needs to make, it needs to choose to move to a, an, a, an economic, uh, a, a system for allocating resources and capital um, which is based on, on efficiency as opposed to uh, ownership. I'm going to go on eventually to several questions that have been raised that are off this topic, but there are two that are still, generally speaking, on the topic of the financial crisis. And uh, the, so I want to raise those while we're still at least somewhat close to that topic. Um, the question is, one question is, what are your comments on Vietnam's current stock market? I would uh, preface that to whoever wants to take that on, uh, uh, that uh, at, when you're on television in the United States uh, and you're giving it, uh, comments about the stock market, you always preface it by saying, none of this should be taken as advice. You should go see your own advisor, <laughs> et cetera, et cetera, so that we all don't get sued for giving you terrible advice. Uh, but uh, the, uh, you know, I remember a meeting, uh, some more than one meeting a, a year or more ago that uh, with some people who were involved very heavily in the stock market in Vietnam trying to explain why 70, 80 to 1 price earnings ratio were really quite normal and sensible <laughs> in the Vietnamese situation. And it's, uh, this is not unique to Vietnam. Essentially, whenever there's a bubble, and a, this was a massive bubble, uh, but it's true of American bubbles, too. There's all of a whole group of financial people explain about how it's very rational to, to have these extraordinary price earnings ratios. And then, of course, uh, they uh, change their tune rather rapidly if they haven't actually left the business having gone broke from following their own advice. But, uh, uh, but what, who would like to comment on whether this is uh, on the bubble? Uh, Jonathan, are you back online? Jonathan? Uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we hear you. Do you want to comment on Hello? the... Uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. we hear you. Can you comment on the stock market? I think my line is, is not is not good enough probably to comment on the stock market. I think David should probably have a, have a whack at this one. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, uh, to have a healthy stock market, you need good companies, uh, good accounting, uh, and good corporate management, uh, where the interests of minority shareholders are protected. Um, most of the companies now listed have, uh, you know, been state companies that retain heavy elements of state governance. Uh, 
so it's really quite hard to know what they're really earning and uh, quite hard to know uh, where those earnings will go in any reliable way in the future. Uh, as a result, uh, I think uh, Vietnam is regarded as a frontier uh, stock market that is highly risky. And uh, it's exactly those markets that have been hit the worst by this uh, financial crisis. Therefore, from a very macro view, you have to say that it's a bad time uh, to get into risky stock markets since so much money is going out. Now, at some point, uh, the, that uh, flight out of uh, these uh, companies and stock markets uh, will cease. And at that point, there may well be values, although it's hard to tell. Um, I think any uh, smart investor will try to do a bottom-up analysis, uh, but you know that is very difficult. So uh, I guess uh, my uh, my observation about the stock market would be that unless or until there's uh, more clarity, uh, it it has to be viewed as a uh, risky investment rather than a prudent one. Uh, another related question uh, that to some degree challenges the view that the uh, financial sector in Vietnam is, is not directly affected by the financial problems uh, in, in the U.S. Uh, the question is that uh, on the impact of the U.S. crisis on Vietnam, Vietnamese authorities should be much more alert. Vietnamese banks actually are quite affected in terms of overseas deposits, trade finance, and higher funding costs. Uh, I don't know. Tuang, do you want to take that on, or uh, David? Tuang, I think, spoke about the banks. Yeah, I, I just uh, spoke about the banks, and uh, my observation is that when I talk with bankers in Ho Chi Minh City, they said that they are not affected. And I guess, you know, if you look at their uh, international operation, I, I don't see the great exposure to the risk that uh, you know brought about by the financial crisis in the U.S. and you know that's what uh, the bankers told me. Of course, they may have some reasons to hide the truth, but clearly, I think you know in the short run, if you look at the you know their portfolio and if you look at their operation in borrowing and lending, I don't think there's a immediate you know threat created by the financial crisis in the U.S. to the Vietnamese banks. So uh, I'm not sure if uh, you can, you know, the, the person who asked question can provide some, you know, information about or, you know, some details about what he or she thinks that, you know, maybe the potential direct uh, threat to the Vietnamese banking system. I, I think uh, I agree with what Tuang said, but I think we have to divide the financial crisis into two parts. One is the fall of groups like Lehman Brothers or uh, Bear Stearns, which was merged. Uh, and the other one is this very recent, last week or two, sort of freezing of the short-term capital markets where uh, you can't issue commercial paper. You know, the banks will not trade with each other. This is a more recent form of a financial crisis. And I think the uh, question really is more directed to that rather than uh, the earlier problems we had this year uh, or last month. Um, the, um, when, when you can't even arrange trade financing, when you can't trust your counterparty, that makes all activity uh, very, very difficult. And, and I can see how you know, uh, Vietnamese banks would be affected by that. Uh, I think uh, that is such a problem uh, that you know the central banks of the world are pouring uh, hundreds of billions or even trillions of dollars trying to unstick uh, that that particular mechanism. And I don't think there's much Vietnam can do about that except hope that those efforts work. And uh, also, uh, on on the rich country side, I think uh, more rapid attempts to recapitalize many of the financial institutions. Uh, to give them more capital so they're more confident uh, taking on even moderate and prudent risks, which they are not now. Now they're just holding on to their money. Well, I might, uh, if I could just uh, add, add to this and uh, maybe, maybe uh, ask Bill Ang to comment a little bit further. Um, one of the recommendations that we make in choosing success has to do with uh, opening up the, the banking sector, and particularly the state-owned commercial banks, to uh, foreign investment. This is uh, and, and allowing 
uh, foreign commercial institutions uh, to take a to take a strategic stake in in these in these banks, and uh, it's something that has been done in many other countries um, successfully, uh, but it hasn't yet worked in Vietnam. And and uh, the sort of the the poster child for the this inability thus far uh, to to bring in this this strategic investment would be the, the Vietcom Bank uh, acquisition. And uh, Ayn, could you maybe give us a sort of a thumbnail sketch of what happened with Vietcom Bank and, and uh, um, what, what uh, you think might need to be done to, to, to make that, that, uh, that process work better in the future? Um, I, I think uh, there's a couple of things here. The first thing is, you know, when you when we talk about the strategic partners, sometimes we misuse the words. Uh, you know, for strategic partners, the, the Vietnamese banks think about the strategic partners as someone who can invest and buy at a higher price than the market price. Okay, so that's that's the situation happened to Vietcom banks. So at the end, it's really hard for Vietcom banks to convince other investment banks that, you know, they should pay a higher price, a pre premium price to buy a Bitcoin bank share. And at the end, the Bitcoin bank issue, you know, uh, uh, the IPO is not that successful. And right now, if you look at the price, of, uh, the, the price of Bitcoin bank share on the market, it's much, much lower than the initial price. So, you know, I think we need to change the way to think about strategic partners. The strategic partner of the banks in Vietnam is someone who can bring in the technology, the expertise, the governance, so that you know the future value of the bank can be higher. And this is exactly the strategy adopted by you know banks in China, for example, the construction bank, which is you know uh, selling. Uh, share to international financial company at a lower price, but after a year, the price, the, the share price is double. So I think that's something Vietnam needs to change in terms of thinking about the strategy, uh, thinking about the way to approach the strategic partner in the future. While we're still on this topic, uh, one of the participants has raised the. Uh, issue that uh, asked, do you know that banks maintain around 10 to 20 percent of deposits in U.S. dollars overseas, oh, and, that, and the higher funding costs, uh, says look at LIBOR now, there will be some shift to euros and use of hedging instruments. Uh, would anybody want to comment further on that from what they've said uh, already? I would, I mean, yes, I am aware that uh, banks do hold uh, deposits uh, overseas and uh, so on, and that LIBOR is often used in, um, in setting interest rates. Um, and again, this goes back to the general collapse of intra-bank intra lending. Uh, the reason LIBOR is so high relative to Treasury or Euro rates of government debt is that uh, no one's quite sure, you know, who is really solvent. And again, this is a, a general gumming up of um, short-term credit that is very, very serious. And um, of course, this affects everybody because uh, in the end, if you can't borrow short-term for things like trade credit, uh, then, you know, you can't trade very easily or it becomes much more expensive. In, a, in essence, the financial crisis is like putting up tariffs. It's reversing the WTO. And um, you know it, it restricts trading to very well capitalized actors, and you know in Vietnam uh, those are relatively few and often with the government. Uh, so uh, the effect of this may be to shift uh, more activity back towards government trading, uh, and and so on. And um, you know that, uh, it, in my view, uh, would probably make things less efficient and less transparent than they ha have been getting. So um, again, I agree with the question that this is a serious issue, this short-term finance issue. And again, I don't see you know, if uh, Chase and Citi are paying higher rates that Vietnamese banks will be able to get around it uh, very well. 
unless the government has some special program, uh, which I think it already does in effect for the state uh, banks. So, uh, you know, uh, I think if anything, uh, this crisis makes it more difficult for non-state actors uh, to operate. Uh, why don't we leave it at that? Let's, uh, let me move on to some questions. We have a couple of questioners who have been patiently waiting. Uh, uh, and uh, but they, the topics weren't directly related to what we've been covering. So let me just uh, raise those questions now. Uh, what role? Uh, the first question: What role can overseas Vietnamese play in Vietnam? That's open to anybody who would like to comment. Well, I, I think um, first of all, overseas. I would I would argue that overseas Vietnamese have been playing a very important role in Vietnam uh, in many areas. But but we mentioned one earlier, which is simply which is by sending money mo uh, money back to Vietnam. And and um, as David uh, mentioned earlier, we 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 suspect that a lot of that money is, has been going uh, n um, not just to, to support relatives, but, but actually to support investment and, and uh, uh, I think particularly in, the private, in, 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 in helping the development of small private firms, although undoubtedly that some of the, the, uh, a significant percentage of that investment in, in recent years has probably been flowing into the, into the financial sector, uh, rather into, the, into real, estate, uh, real estate development, the real estate investment. Um, I, I uh, earlier commented on education, and I think that's another area where uh, overseas Vietnamese um, can can certainly have have knowledge and expertise to contribute. Although, um, as I as I also noted, I think that uh, frankly the uh, the incentives that uh, universities in Vietnam are offering not only overseas Vietnamese but 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 uh, Vietnamese nationals with overseas uh, overseas training are are, are, are not that uh, are, are are really not that uh, attractive so it's understandable that we're not seeing uh, um, necessarily so many people uh, deciding to return to uh, to pursue to pursue academic careers so those are those are those are two thoughts that I have and I don't know if any of my colleagues would like to to throw in any ideas. To Ang, or do you have any? I think we'll have any further uh, comment on it. OK. Uh, a, another question, uh, actually, it's now been combined with several questions, but I won't go to the part of the question that deals with the banking crisis. We may have time to come back to it. I'm not sure. But the first part of the question that was raised earlier uh, was about what one learns in the master's in public policy program. Uh, I assume, ref are they referring to the Harvard Kennedy School or are they referring to the Fulbright Economic Teaching Program? Uh, but the, the broader question related to that, are, they, uh, is, are the graduates of high quality uh, af uh, what, after they graduate? And uh, of course, as a faculty member here, I should probably say, yes, of course, they're of high quality. Uh, and I've also taught in the Flipside program, as have, uh, has every, uh, most of the people uh, here this, this morning or this evening. And uh, you know, I think the, the Fulbright Economic Teaching Program, and part of its curriculum is significantly uh, it's not designed to be identical to the Kennedy School because it has a far more Vietnamese content in it. But I think it's fair to say that that kind of teaching and public policy teaching with a heavy emphasis on economic policy has proved to be of considerable value to large numbers of Vietnamese. Then uh, how many have gone through the program now? 600, 7? We've had, uh, since, since FETP, since the Fulbright School was established in the mid-90s, we've had about 2,000 uh, Vietnamese women and men from, um, from, the, the, from the, the public sector and the private sector uh, have attended our uh, programs. Um, we have had, I believe, more than 700 individuals have uh, completed our one-year full-time program in applied economics and public policy. Now, as many of you um, uh, may be aware, as of uh, this year, we have moved to a two-year master's of, of public policy program, the first year of which incorporates um, uh, 
uh, much of the content of the original of the of the original one year program in applied economics and, and public policy. Yeah, um, I, I think if, if the question was about the Fulbright program, um, first of all, the admission is quite selective. Uh, we take a small fraction of those that take the test and apply. Um, the uh, graduates, in general, have done very well after they get out. Uh, I was told that the salaries uh, for our graduates are higher than those uh, for, uh, you know, graduates of, uh, you know, uh, masters or whatever it, uh, from uh, the uh, many other Vietnamese institutions. And uh, third, I mean, just as a teacher there, I find uh, consistently a, a very high level of enthusiasm, a, a desire to learn, of, of a willingness to discuss uh, problems seriously um, that I think uh, puts it right up there with, uh, you know, other very, very good programs that I've taught in uh, around the world. So um, my own biased impression of the Fulbright program is that it's doing a very good job, uh, that its students come in uh, capable and committed. Uh, they leave with more knowledge, useful knowledge, uh, than when they came in with, and they do well after they leave. Um, I hope soon we can start charging tuition. <laughs> <laughs> The, uh, let me <coughs> just deal with two more financial questions, and then I, I think we should wrap it up with three more general questions about how the, <coughs> the uh, effect of this report and how it could be made <coughs> more effective. The two financial questions, however, are what's likely to happen to the banks in uh, 2009 and 2000, uh, the Vietnamese banks in 2009 and 2010. And then uh, there's also a question uh, of moral hazard with the Vietnamese banking system. Uh, that they think they basically, the government won't let them go bankrupt, and this leads to uh, behavior uh, that uh, is harmful uh, to, to the economy and, and to the banking system. Of course, related to this is the fact that they loan, uh, as has been said on, on more than once, that. Uh, they loan mainly to state-owned enterprises and so on. Uh, but it's particularly the problem of the state-owned banks. Anyway, does anybody want to make a last remark connected with what's going to happen in 2009 or 10 about moral hazards in the banking system beyond what, what you've already said? Do I? Let me try to do that. Uh, I, I think uh, the Vietnamese banking system has gone through a you know several big changes in the last couple of years, and one one important change is uh, you know new banks are established, and old banks, especially the small rural banks, have been upgraded into the urban banks. So the consequences is those new new banks or upgraded banks are trying very hard to attract new customers. So. What they did was to land, you know, easily, and you know, with a with a light of the due caution. And another thing is, they are trying to establish many branches in 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 many different places, and that pushes up the cost. So on the one hand, they are landing heavily, and on the other hand, the cost of operation is increasing and if you put that into the context of the competition in the banking system in Vietnam you see that you know you you, you already saw the competition in terms of you know lowering the interest rate and so on in the last couple of years and then you know you see the the uh, you know I mean the lending rate but then beat up the the interest rate the uh, saving rates and recently the those banks are lending heavily to the stock market uh, investor and you know real estate investors for example uh, from my conversation of some banks you know several banks have uh, the you know about 40 percent to 50 percent of their credits are allocated to you know real estate or stock uh, market investors which is very dangerous, especially during this time of, of the macroeconomic instability. So what happened in the next uh, several months or a year is 
some, uh, you know, many of the loans to real estate and stock market investors will be due because normally the term of those loans is about a year. So they loan, they, they lend to the, uh, they lend to real estate and stock market investors about a year ago when the market boomed. And then a year from that, which is the first quarter, the last quarter of this year, or the first quarter of the next year, those loans will be due. And as I said before, you know, that will make the, uh, you know, that will, uh, those those banks will accumulate bad debts and non-performing loans. And as a result, those, you know, several banks can fail. And if you put yourself into the position of the central bank, it could be very dangerous because bank, intra-bank lending in Vietnam is heavy. So if one bank fails, some other banks can be failed, can fail as well. So facing with that problem, the what the central bank can do? My my guess would be the central bank can be very reluctant to let one or two banks fail because that will influence and create a negative externality to the whole system, and that where the, the moral hazard comes in, and Unless the central bank of Vietnam impose a, you know, stricter supervision into the system, I think the, the, the banking system in Vietnam will become, you know, less stable and more risky in the next coming years. I, I agree with that, and I, I would just add that the uh, deposit rates are well below the inflation rate. So, you know, anyone that is thinking about saving has options, you know, to put it into foreign currency, euros, if not dollars, uh, gold, uh, you know, real estate, uh, if, if they can get a good buy. Uh, and uh, the current policies actually, I think, push uh, savings away from uh, banks and financial forms into other forms. And that in itself, I think, uh, is unfortunate and uh, really uh, is, is uh, sort of taxing or discouraging financial development generally. So you have not only, again, the short-term problem, to I correctly identified, but the longer-term problem that it doesn't make any rational sense if you keep losing money to put in real terms uh, to put your money in the bank. And I think both those uh, need to be addressed. Well, let me... Uh wrap up with a, by combining really uh, uh, two or three questions that are, the theme is fairly uh, common. Um, one, one question, for example, says we know there are so many issues now for Vietnam. Can we help prior, prioritize some of them? How can we convince the Vietnamese government to consider our policy suggestions and raise questions any of the way we are doing? Uh, the another question specifically said what progress is being made in, in reform of the education system uh, in terms of the, of, of the report. Uh, another, how do you push the government to implement our policy suggestions from choosing success, such as rationalizing state cronies, electricity Vietnam or, or state banks, in order to push the efficiency within the economy? Do you think it is possible that such state con companies can be pressured to be more efficient. Uh, but I think, you know, what I think this would be a useful time maybe for each of us or each of you all to wrap up uh, with a statement about, you know, how do you actually uh, uh, <laughs> implement some of these ideas? I mean, to what extent are they being implemented? To what extent could uh, new ideas and new ways of, of going about trying to get them implemented and encouraging the government to implement? Any comment in the broad area of, of uh, how do you get these changes that are recommended in choosing success uh, actually uh, in place uh, in Vietnam? And I think everybody should come in on, on this. Uh, so uh, why don't we start we and go in the same order as we did at the outset. So start with David, uh, Tu Ang, uh, Ben, and end with Doug. It's hard to change when you don't have to. And I think that is the problem the Vietnamese government faces. It still sees huge flows of foreign investment. Uh, it thinks it has the macro, short-term macro problems licked. 
and you know it basically thinks that with you know trimming and and a little bit of uh, uh, change here and there, it can basically go forward uh, the way it has done. Um, I think that uh, it will be hard to, uh, to get real changes unless there is a crisis, um, unless you know the macro economy turns uh, sharply lower. Uh, and and uh, perhaps uh, you know foreign exchange or pressures uh, like uh, last spring uh, reoccur. Uh, without that, I think uh, it's good to have a robust discussion to criticize um, specific uh, projects or investments that may be mistaken. But I think the uh, general trend uh, will remain until uh, the government and and the decision makers are persuaded uh, beyond doubt that um, you really do need to change in order to survive. And uh, you know, I, I'm afraid that's where I would leave things. Do I? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I, I think it's, it's important to start with the dialogue between the government and you know, research community and public policy makers. And I think that's, that's something choosing success has achieved. So. Uh, from our observations, what what choosing success, you know, is really successful, is to create a active, you know, discussion in Vietnam about the current issues and you know the long term issues for with the implication for the future of Vietnam. And as in uh, choosing success and in other research papers, what we are trying to do is to provide a critical a constructive analysis so that we can have a discussion, very frank and constructive discussion with the government and with the you know, policy makers in Vietnam. And recently the Prime Minister expressed, you know, the, uh, the, the, the his wish to to uh, you know to more you know frank and critical analysis and in the recent meeting with the Prime Minister just about two weeks ago in Hanoi, I think the Prime Minister is very welcoming in the critical analysis, and the Prime Minister of Vietnam is showing the willingness to engage into some kind of discussion about the policy in Vietnam. I think that's a very good sign, and we should hope for the continuing you know, debate like that in Vietnam. And another thing I think is, uh, is important is some of the topics, some of the themes that we discuss in Choosing Success and in other you know, uh, uh, discussion papers are becoming reality. For example, in the Choosing Success, we did talk about the potential risks of a financial crisis you know, about the exchange rates and other things. And I think some of us become reality. And it is exactly during the difficult time that the government can hear fine and critical, you know, voice. Other, in other words, you know, we somehow come in a timely manner in the right time in the sense that, you know, we talk, we discuss about the problems in the France and then we are trying to continue the dialogue with the government, you know, in a constructive manner. And what we are trying to do not is not to convince the government, but what we are doing is right. What we are trying to do is open a you know a public sphere for discussion, so that the government is more informed in order to make the right decision. That's what we are trying to do, and you know, in order to 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 assess you know the success of our papers and other discussion papers, I think we need uh, some more time. But at the beginning, I want to conclude that you know what we are trying to do and a successful uh, to a certain degree is to create a lively debate among the public policy makers and among the you know uh, press about what important to the Vietnamese economy uh, in the short term in the long term. Uh, thank you, Jonathan, would you like to come to this? You have a perspective both from having worked on the paper and actually having uh, sponsored this kind of research both by the Fulbright Economic Teaching Program but also by others in, uh, in Vietnam. 
Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm afraid that if I start talking, my line will go dead, so that will encourage me to be brief. Um, I, I agree very strongly with, uh, with, with what uh, Tulang just said, which is that uh, good policy will ultimately require quite a lot of input, not just from the Fulbright School and the Harvard group, but from as many different voices as possible and to raise the level of, of discussion about policy, not just among academics, but also the public discourse. And I think that's, that's really essential uh, to move forward from where we are. And I think one of the very gratifying things about the response to choosing success was that a lot of people have said to us, well, you know, this really raised up the sort of the quality of uh, what we're all talking about, and many of the things people have discussed before, and some of the things were new, but the nice thing about it was that the tone was such that it was constructive and seeking input and seeking to give some some opinions, but clearly also asking for more discussion. And I think that that's really where we need to go, both with the with future research with policy papers, but also, you know, that's the point of the, uh, the Masters in Public Policy. So I, I agree very strongly with Tuang that it's not going to happen automatically, but the more voices that are present and the higher the quality of the discussion, the more likely that policymakers will ultimately be able to latch on to things that not only are useful and practical and theoretically sound, but that which... Uh, are implementable, and I think that's where we're 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 trying to get from where we are now to to that point. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dwight. I would uh, I would would just comment very briefly um, on what I think is. Uh, I would like to begin by saying, um, you know, the government has taken, I think, some, there have been some very encouraging uh, steps that, that the government has taken in recent months that um, I think are, are broadly in line with, with some of the recommendations, certainly, that we've been making, and I think uh, other, other, other analysts inside and outside of government as well. Certainly, one is, is reducing the gasoline subsidy this past July. That was not an easy decision to take, but it was one that the government had to make, and they did. Um, more recently, uh, the government um, announcing a policy of, of increasing electricity tariffs. Uh, that is also clearly very important um, to to ensure that there that there is a, that, that, that there's enough incentive for people to 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 to, to boost power generation capacity. Um, but I think that it's not it's not enough to be headed broadly in the right direction. Uh, how fast you get there is also very important, and um, so and, and this factor of speed. And um, to, to, I know that one of the final wrap up questions was about was about higher education, and I can think of no better uh, uh, sector. Um, where this issue of speed applies, then higher education. I had a discussion recently with a, with a foreign uh, uh, executive in, in, in the high-tech sector with knowledge of Vietnam, and, and, uh, and his assessment was that Vietnam had at the most five years, five more years, to demonstrate its seriousness to improve higher education, and, and, and particularly in science and technology. And in his view, if Vietnam didn't change, uh, didn't do some sort of take take some more urgent action. Uh, that Vietnam was just going to lose high tech investment, and uh, the the high tech investment would would go other would would go other places. And so, um, in higher education, there are there are certain policy statements, and uh, that the government has adopted Resolution 14 that was adopted uh, just about three years ago uh, this month, I believe. Um, but uh, I think that, and, and while Resolution 14 laid out laid out some important priorities, uh, I think that the implementation has, to put it generously, has been pretty slow, and uh, that's going to that's going to have to change. Finally, uh, Doug Gardner, uh, with your broad international perspective on these issues. Thank you, um, Dwight. 
I read the report in English, and I was delighted to hear that there is an equally well-crafted report in the Vietnamese language. I think this was a was a was a, a brilliant idea from the get-go, and I was also pleased to hear that this has been read by the highest levels of the Vietnamese government, and the donor community was second in line, and, and I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, power to that. I've spent a lot of time in each country that I've worked in thinking about the leadership and, you know, how they make decisions, um, and it's an inexact science, and there's no, there's no right or wrong on this, but I think what you said, too, on about what can we do is provide decision makers with information, with a take on reality, and with options so that you have an informed decision maker um, from the get-go. And then you ask, well, what are the incentives here? I think, David, you mentioned one, several, you know, avoiding the crisis, survival. There's, there's that side. But there's also the opportunity of seeing the pie grow, that there is, can be much more available to everybody. Um, and then also a very distinct characteristic to Vietnam, which I think can be healthy, and you mentioned this, Ben, in the education sector, not yet being there, which is competition. Um, and I think Vietnam is very much aware of its neighboring countries, of its position um, on the globe. So I think if decision makers have this kind of ammunition and they're supported to grow the pie, avoid the negative, and succeed globally, these are the kinds of subtleties that will help um, the country and, and government of Vietnam and uh, get full value from this report. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. Uh, it's my pleasure to really thank uh, all of you who have participated in what for us was this experimental effort uh, for the Kennedy School, uh, not so experimental. They've been doing it for some time. But on this online seminar, uh, we thank all of you who participated. We thank you for your very interesting uh, and useful questions and that has fostered much of the discussion that we've had had today. Uh, we hope that in the future we'll be able to do something like this uh, again, uh, dealing uh, with other aspects of the Vietnamese economy. And for now, though, it's uh, saying good night to those in Vietnam, and uh, it's time to get to work uh, for those who are here in Cambridge. So thank you uh, very much for all being with us. Thank you.